Thank you very much. Thank all you for coming. And I want to thank the Frist and its staff for giving me this opportunity to talk to you. The exhibit is really quite impressive. And uh, I'm also glad they, they gave me this opportunity because I think a lot of people in Nashville don't know that Vanderbilt is one of the premier centers in the world of the study of pre-Columbian civilizations, both Mesoamerica, you know, Mexico and Central America, and South America, where we have uh, studies in the, in the Andes and coasts of South America. And this is uh, something that's going on, or digs going on. We have one of our, Tom Dillahay, one of the most prominent figures in South American archaeology is here. Uh, and the, the exhibit has great pieces from, from uh, all of them. And um, today I'm going to talk about the, the art of the Maya, but putting it into the context of what it meant what the use of the art was, and how it ties in to the, develop, the apogee of the civilization, but also how the, the great artworks contributed to the collapse of civilizations. Uh, art can be very, very important in, in, in the history of civilizations, a lot more important than we usually think of it as being in our own society. And in these pre-Columbian civilizations, it had very important religious and political functions. Uh, that are associated with, with the, both the, the fluorescence and then the disintegration of these societies. So let me, we, and we have a lot of other development, I'll mention at the end some of our development programs and so on, but I just think it's important to, for you uh, to keep track of what's going on in Vanderbilt and with these exploratory archaeology. Now the Maya civilization, I always, when you talk about Maya art, you have to tell people what the Maya civilization is because most people have no idea. Um, this is a civilization that, that existed, the classic Maya civilization, uh, existed in this green area, the lowlands of northern Guatemala, parts of Mexico, Honduras, Belize, and the Yucatan Peninsula which is uh, covered by uh, a tropical forest environment. And this is one of the most amazing things, is that the Maya civilization did develop in such a difficult and fragile environment. The civilization is most famous for its ruins in the jungle, uh, temples and palaces overgrown with jungle. The uh, sort of stereotype you see in a lot of movies of lost civilizations in the jungle. The Maya fit that uh, perfectly, which leads to a lot of interest and a lot of silliness, too, uh, about the Maya. Usually when they have those, like, Tomb Raider or something, it's a combination of Angkor Wat with Maya and the Aztec calendar stone, all kind of stuck together. Because there are not that many lost civilizations that are actually in jungle environments, so they, they have to combine them. Let me know if you can. I, I, I'm Cajun, so I tend to use my hands and pace around. If you can't hear me, if I move away from the mic, scream or something, wave your hands. Uh, the cities, this is showing you the enormous cities that, that uh, we excavate in the jungle. And in their original form, the, the structures were plastered and painted red with temples of many colors. It's well known, the sites are well known for their uh, tremendous architecture. This is a palace from the site of Palenque in Mexico, and this is an acropolis from the site of Piedras Negras in, in Guatemala. At, at Conquen, we have one of the largest palaces, I'll get to that in a minute, that's ever been found. If all of this stuff didn't fit the stereotype of uh, the National Geographic stereotype of lost civilizations enough, we have temples with tombs in them and hieroglyphic inscriptions that can sometimes lead you to the tombs. So we have the full package deal. Um, and in the, in the tombs, of course, there are these beautiful objects, like some of the ones that are up in the exhibit are from uh, tomb context, I'm sure. And most famous are the carved jade objects, and I'll get back to that in a little bit and the beautiful ceramic vessels that sometimes have hieroglyphic inscriptions that give us a great deal of information. And uh, the 
Another aspect are the carved monumental sculptures, quite elaborate. This is a king. You can see his face here, his jade, ear spools, the headdress. And he's holding his arms in this position. I'll show you in a minute. He's just done a bloodletting. And on the backs of these monuments are hieroglyphic inscriptions. We also have, this is from Conquen, the, the site that Vanderbilt's been excavating. Um, and these hieroglyphic inscriptions give us a great deal of information, detailed information, on the history of the civilization and allow, in archaeology, you know, we struggle to get good dates on things because radiocarbon dates and some of the chemical dates have plus or minuses of 50 years or even 100 years, so it's hard to get very precise dates. The Maya calendar gives dates in the context of the cities where it's located, describes historical events, and you can actually see the exact day on which something occurred. And this is one of the inscriptions that shows one of their great cycles of time. As you know, one, their biggest cycle of time, a cycle of 13 baktuns, 13 periods of 400 years, just ended on December 21st, and the world was supposed to end. Uh, and it did, well, you know, let down again, like all these comets and everything. Um, but it was great for archaeology. I had a lect we have an exhibit and a lecture series in Europe. And on December 21st, I gave a talk in Helsinki, and they packed the house with people who wanted to spend their last moments on Earth <laughs> listening to me. <laughs> I don't know. And that's the, that's, that's the spectacular side of Maya archaeology that you see in National Geographic and in their films and so on. They kind of own me, um, so a lot of the pictures in here are from, are from them. However, I want to make it clear that's not real archaeology. That's really a tiny part of what we do. What we mostly do is study hundreds of houses of all different social levels, and the Maya house complexes then as today are a series of thatched roof huts over low stone or clay platforms where the people lived and carried on their daily activities. And this is what we excavate uh, more than anything else. We have a palace at Kangwen, you know, we have some small temples and we have caves with lots of treasures, but 90% of the time this is what you're, you're analyzing. And the Maya are a wonderfully behaved culture from the archaeologist's point of view because this, this is a house. You see this stone is the base of the platform that the house was on. And then there was a hut above it which has disintegrated. But the Maya threw their garbage behind their houses because they had gardens. And they buried the dead under the floor of the house because they were ancestor worshippers, so they wanted their dead with them. So when you excavate, you have the actual people. You can do all kinds of analyses now to know about health and where they were born and all kinds of things, status. And underneath the floors, you have these burials. And from the type of pottery you find and the artifacts you find, you can tell not only the date of the structure, but the social status of the of the people in it and this uh, is what this is bro these are various broken pieces of pottery and pieced together whole vessels right now we have about 300,000 broken pieces of pottery from Conquen and this is this is what we really do for every month that you excavate you end up doing about six months or more of analysis putting hundreds of thousands of potsherds, coding them for all different kinds of characteristics, putting them in a computer, and reconstructing. What we really do is to reconstruct the sociology of ancient cities. These are cities. The temples and the palaces are just the kind of downtown sexy buildings. But what we really do is a kind of sociology to try to figure out the economy, how it functioned, the social structure, the political structure, and for that you need to to study everything, not just the, the sexy stuff. Now, um, one of the characteristics of Maya civilization that is most important, you could say most mysterious, but we've made a lot of headway in understanding it, is the fact that it's in this subtropical humid forest, close to a rainforest. 
in this green area. And these kinds of environments have very thin soils. Most of the energy is tied up in the 200 feet high jungle canopy. Uh, they have few navigable rivers and peri periodic shortages of water. It is like all rainforest. It's a very rich but very fragile environment. And it is not the sort of environment that high civilizations usually develop in. In fact, today, uh, the policies of USAID and others in protecting these kinds of forests are focused on keeping people out because as populations move in, the forest is destroyed. The Maya, who were unaware of the USAID policies, um, <laughs> they went ahead uh, and for 2,000 years had a, a, a very successful high civilization with millions of people living in this range. Probably, the, the, the population estimates vary, but somewhere between 10 and 25 million people were living in this area. And today, it, uh, there's about half a million people in this same region, and they've managed and they've moved back in. In the last 40 years, they've managed to almost completely destroy the rainforest. Some of their secrets we now know. One of them was this dispersed population, uh, residential pattern that is not like our own. It's not urban and then rural. There are green cities, and you have the ceremonial centers in the, in the middle, but you have houses and gardens uh, scattered through household gardens behind. They were garden cities uh, with a lot of agriculture going on inside of the cities. And all kinds of special techniques to have successful rainforest agriculture. They had uh, dams and small lakes, terraces. They left areas of rainforest uh, alone to be places where they could hunt deer. They had orchards. They had stone box gardens. And these uh, used what the, the paleoecologists that work on these projects. The projects, by the way, when, they, when you talk about an archaeological project, again, it's not like in the movies. Uh, the project director is just a kind of CEO and administrator, mostly have to do all kinds of crap with the governments and the landowners and the narcos and whoever, and manage and do research design and so on. But you have a whole team of all different kinds of specialists who actually carry out the archaeology. And to get back to my story, the paleo uh, ecologists analyze, and one of the secrets of the Maya civilization was their use of human waste, of their own waste, in stone box gardens to create very, very fertile areas for intensive agriculture. So this whole complex of techniques allowed them to do what we really can't do today, and that is to successfully maintain millions of people in a rainforest environment. And a, not, a question you always get is like, how do you find these lost cities? You know, all of that lost cities. Well, they're all over the place. There's 400 registered in this Paten region of northern Guatemala alone. There's one city, and then there'll be an uh, area of slightly less population than another one. And uh, the difficulty is not finding, the difficulty is getting approval and setting it up to be safe to excavate there, getting approvals from the government, and above all, raising the money, which is a lot of what we do. And right now, in the, in the middle of accounting, for money. That's the, the most unrealistic thing in the Indiana Jones movies is when he's like jumping off a train onto a horse or something and he gets no receipts for anything. <laughs> he, he would come straight back and go straight to prison. Uh, so it's, it's actually, there's a lot, a lot to archaeology that isn't as exciting. The cities um, have causeways and reservoirs and temples and palaces. They're very complex. And the political organization of classic Maya civilization uh, was very, very different from our own. And most of the art is tied directly into that kind of political organization. And it was an organization where you had holy kings. The, the rulers were divine. They were worshipped, especially after their death. They were buried in temples and were worshipped. Um, 
and the rulers combined in the, it was the strength and the weakness of classic Maya civilization, the rulers combined everything into one person, Kahulahau, the Holy Lord. They were governors, uh, who, administrators from palaces, receiving tribute and controlling governmental decisions. They were the war leaders, who you see the, the king here. It's actually not a king and a bunch of midgets. Uh, in Maya art, if you're, it's like Egyptian art. If you're an important person, you're big. If you're less important, you're little. Um, and you see his role here as a war leader. And they were also ball players. They would uh, dress up in, in this kind of gear and play the Maya ball game, which was a, a very sacred game. Um, and so they had all of these combined into one. And above all, they were the center of these enormous rituals, which were somewhat like the rituals at, at places like Angkor Wat and so on in Southeast Asia, where uh, tens of thousands of people would come into the centers, especially at the end of certain time periods or after a victory or with the birth of a prince or the death of a king. And there would be these gigantic rituals, pageantry, and display. And these were an important source of power for the state because the, the power of the ruler was more than anything else his role as a holy lord. And the Maya conception of the universe was that of a great seba tree, the largest tree in the jungle. And, uh, radiating like the branches from the Seba tree were planes of the universe. There were nine planes of the underworld and 13 planes of the heavens. And in between, well, is the world that we live on, which was pictured as a two-headed snake or a two-headed crocodilian or turtle floating in this infinite lake. And our world was on the, the, his back. And you see that here. These are actually representations of serpents. Doesn't look like it. The Maya always represented the serpents uh, as when they strike. If you've ever seen a serpent strike, they really can open their jaws, unhinge their jaws, and they sort of strike like that. And to celebrate this vision of the universe and to propitiate the deities, and especially the ancestors, to have good harvests, to have successful wars, and so on. The Maya constructed their ceremonial centers, and in a way, this looks like a big theater, uh, a big amphitheater, and it was. These are, uh, I call these theater states after, the, again, the models that are used in Southeast Asia of states where a great deal of power comes from this ritual display. And you see the temples, monuments to the dead kings, there are kings buried in each of these. And uh, this is just one. You see a ball court here where they would play the sacred ball game. And the center of the whole ritual was the Holy Lord. He was the embodiment. He was the embodiment of the world tree. He was like a tree. Uh, and in the many of the monuments, it's portrayed with a, with a death deity or a sacrifice captive at his feet. And then going up, he held the two-headed scepter of our plane. He was the master of the earthly plane. And then his headdress goes up into these elaborate feathers and so on, indicating the highest levels of the heavens and the sacred, the muon bird, the sacred bird that was in the heavens. So he was the embodiment of them, and he was the center of these rituals. This piece is in the exhibit which is actually, you, it's, it's hard to see if, when you're not accustomed to the art, but you can see his legs here, an arm, there's his eye, and he's standing as a world tree, and then all of this is elaborate headdress here, and then with ancestor images in the heavens. Now, for these rituals, the most sacred thing in the universe was the blood of the king. The, this was the, the, the holiest substance, the blood of, of a ruler or of a high noble, but especially of the rulers, the Kahulahau. And so sacrificial rit rituals were very much centered around blood. All of the temples were originally painted blood red. Uh, the plaster was painted blood red. 
And in some of the, some of the ceremonies, you had uh, human sacrifice, as you see on this altar here. You see a, a king that's been captured, an enemy king. He still has, has his headdress, but he's been stripped naked and humiliated, and he's being sacrificed on an altar. Now, this whole human sacrifice thing among the Maya is really blown out of proportion. That Apocalypto, arguably the worst movie ever made, um, has this vision of the Maya, which has nothing to do, the Maya did not have very much human sacrifice. They would sacrifice captive kings and sometimes high nobles, but it was a sort of a quality, not quantity thing. You would, great ceremony, you would sacrifice a captured king. And this sort of meat factory that they had in Apocalypto is a, sort of vaguely based on the Aztecs so sort of like Aztecs on crack or something, who are in central Mexico, you know, uh, a thousand years later. The Maya offering of blood, however, was very, very central, and the blood was usually their own. The, the offering was auto-sacrifice, uh, bloodletting, and it was practiced in honor of your ancestors at all levels of the society to the dead who were buried under the floor. But the highest level, their, their high mass, were the bloodlettings of the king. And you see this is a, an image showing the king getting ready to bloodlet. And this instrument um, is, uh, it's an unfortunate term, penis perforator, uh, a jade bloodletter that was used to lacerate the genitals. And the, the, the rulers would, uh, inside of the temple, they would lacerate themselves and they would run their hands under the loincloth and they would drip the blood into a censer as you see here. And this is what's happening way up on top in the temples. The queens would also bloodlet, but the queens would pull ropes with thorns through their tongues uh, and also lacerate their cheeks. Part of the offering is the pain. This is not, uh, this is not unusual. Uh, I mean, they, they had this in medieval times in Europe, too. Part of what you're offering up is the pain, but also the blood. And the blood drips down into these bowls. And you can see the purpose of this was for the, the greatest ritual of the state, which was to bring up from the below, from the underworld, to bring up the ancestors, or to draw down from the heavens the gods to communicate with the king. And in this image, this is actually a queen, you can see this bowl, it has paper on it with blood spots, the glyph for blood, and it's been lit. And coming out of that in the smoke is the vision serpent. And you see the open jaws of the serpent here, and out of that is emerging an ancestor to communicate with the queen. This one's a little bit clearer. You see the vessel, it's a very simple vessel in this case, uh, with the, the burning bark paper, the vision serpent, and the ancestor emerging to speak to the queen. By the way, with, with art, you know, aesthetics is always an amazing thing. The Maya thought what was beautiful was having a sloping forehead, a big hooked nose, drooping lower lip, and crossed eyes. And they uh, did cranial deformation of children of the upper classes who had to be beautiful, um, causing the sloping forehead and the weak chin and so on, and dangling a jade bead between the eyes and um, exaggerating the characteristics. This is, again, not, not unusual. We, uh, in our society, everybody, uh, women are all supposed to look like uh, anorexic Norwegian models. Um, and so there's uh, a lot of emphasis on that, and all of us who are parents spend an enormous amount of money on orthodontic work uh, for our children. So there's, and, and, and also there's a tendency to have racial characteristics of your own group exaggerated to make you more beautiful. And the Maya have naturally somewhat sloping foreheads and large noses and so on, weak chins. And that, they exaggerated those characteristics to show beauty. And you see, again, uh, the, the bark paper with this arising. This is my fame, favorite sculpture. This is from Yash Chilana site in Mexico. 
and it shows the king and the queen and their bloodletting together. She's pulling a rope through his tongue. He's hacking away here with a penis perforator. And here's the bowl. They're bleeding into the same bowl. It's, it's kind of romantic, don't you think it's... This is my favorite romantic Maya piece. It's a good marriage, you know, the family that bleeds together. Um, this piece, which is in the exhibit, which is quite magnificent, um, this incensario is one of those, it's a more elaborate form, but it's one of the kind of, of sensors that would be used for this. Uh, the blood and the paper would go into this, and then it would be lit, and the smoke would, would rise out of it. You should, if you haven't been to the exhibit yet, this is really, I think this is my favorite thing in the exhibit. Afterwards, the kings would emerge from the temples, come down the steps, display their, their bloody hands, uh, and come down with these enormous costumes, like 200 pounds of costumes on scaffolding. We know this is not just in the art, because we find these in the burials. We found one at Conquen where a weird preservation, the actual feathers were stained into the mud uh, and you could see the colors of the feathers going all the way down to the, the feet. And they would announce uh, whatever the prophecies were to go to war, whatever the advice was from the ancestors. And these were all part of huge rituals that lasted sometimes three days and were the glue that held together the states because subordinate lords, rival lords from other states would attend and they would be in addition to the big, the big genital bloodletting, there would also be lots of other ceremonies, ball games, and then in the palaces sort of wild and esoteric shamanistic um, celebrations. This is showing a party that was held after a bloodletting and a victory. It's my favorite one as a Cajun because these guys are dressed up like crawfish. See this? That's my theory. This shows another one and you can see the lords are dancing. Um, there's um, he dancing here and they're, they're under the influence of, over here is an enema pot and they're under the influence of hallucinogenic enemas. They're, the jungle's full of all these natural hallucinogens and they would take them in the form of enemas and then transform into jaguars and so on, um, which was part of the king's ability and dance. Now this system of, of governance, uh, politics, religion, economics, all rolled into one, was the, the reason why the Maya have so much art. Uh, the, you know, art is not, not every period of time has the same amount of art of great importance. The Renaissance is a period that's famous for the incredible amount of art uh, in the way of not just paintings, but architecture, cathedrals, and, and uh, sculpture, and all of it. And the reason for that in the Renaissance, I think, is pretty similar to the reason for that being with the Maya. And that was that there were societies in which there was a very intense political status rivalry, competition between different states, not just in war, but in how beautiful your cathedrals or temples could be, how elaborate your ceremonies, how much artwork you could give out to patrons and kings and sublords. All of that was tied into the status of the ruler and was a competition between the different city-states because the Maya never unified into any kind of unified political movement. They had small individual city-states, hundreds of them, and then sometimes there were larger groupings into larger alliances, but throughout the entire classic period, which is the sort of uh, peak period of the Maya civilization from 300 to about 800, 850 AD, during that period, these kings were constantly battling each other, making alliances, marrying each other, capturing each other and decapitating each other, uh, and competing in the size of their rituals, the quality of their art. In fact, it was like the Renaissance in a way too, because uh, uh, sometimes they would capture artisans from another city and bring them back to do art in the, in the victorious city. And when uh, there was a victory 
or better ceremonies uh, or whatever the, uh, uh, an advantage in status rivalry, that particular state would have more architecture and more followers and a greater apogee uh, during that period. The Holy Lords were more um, successful. So you had have really charismatic kings, kings who combined sort of uh, the qualities of uh, uh, Bill Clinton, uh, a, uh, a general, um, Mick Jagger, uh, and Pele or whoever, the Beckham, uh, as a great ball player. All of that had to be rolled into one and was the source of this intense status rivalry. Part of that r status rivalry was warfare, which was very highly ritualized among the Maya. It wasn't practical in the sense that we would think of it. A lot, one of the goals was to try to capture, not kill, the enemy king. Uh, and the, they went into battle, as you see here, this is a ruler and these are captives who were being bled for their blood. And here are some of the captains and they would go in elaborate outfits, elaborate costumes. Again, requiring a great deal of art for these costumes and for the jewelry that went with them. And the temple's construction was another part of the status rivalry. And as the classic period of the Maya went on, as you started to get into the seventh, eighth century, it just spiraled out of control. The amount of architecture and art, the number of monuments per 20 year period, the Maya uh, calendar was base 20, and so we can measure from their inscriptions more and more temples, more and more centers, more and more monuments, more and more palaces, more and more works of art intensifying as you came to this crescendo. And the same would be with their sculpture and their science. The Maya had very uh, elaborate mathematical and astronomical skills. They had calculated the elliptical orbit of Venus. They could predict eclipses and had a mathematics that was, was very impressive. But all of this was, it was for not practical scientific purposes, but for religious purposes and also for the purpose of competing in the status rivalry. And these are monuments from the site of Kirigua. They're about 35 feet high. On the back of them are these huge mathematical tables multiplying up to, this one multiplies up to into the 40 million, just showing off their math. And uh, this, and then of course the other center would have to construct in its own style more monuments so as to compete and impress the, the visitors and thus gain followers and tribute. And the artworks that adorned some of the palaces uh, and temples, uh, like you see this uh, deity here, this is a, a corn deity, and uh, there are, there's a good uh, stucco mask upstairs that's probably from uh, architecture, part of the decorations that covered the palaces and temples. At, I'll show you in a second. At Conquen, we have the largest of these that, where I'm excavating. We have the largest of these that have ever been found. And beautiful ceramic vessels that were not only put in the tombs but given as gifts, uh, as offerings. When people came to the ceremonies, they would take back something like this. Or in smaller rituals, when kings would visit, they would give these beautiful ceramic vessels or works of art, uh, again, in this competitive framework. This is from the exhibit upstairs. This is another piece from the exhibit that is interesting because it has this primary standard sequence, it's called. It's a repeated sequence of hieroglyphs that have the same hieroglyphs on each pot, but then with just a couple of them different on every pot, and they're found in tombs. And, uh, Michael Coe, Yale's most prominent uh, archaeologist, did about three books on these vessels in which he wrote about how, uh, he's a very great archaeologist, but you know, we all miss a few. He wrote about how this is some ritual incantation, must be some holy incantation, because they were in funeral uh, vessels. Well, uh, the epigrapher, the hieroglyphic specialist, because this is something is you always have a, a specialist who just reads the glyphs. And he, when he was a graduate student at Vanderbilt, deciphered these glyphs and discovered that they say, this is a, a vase 
that held chocolate that was owned by, and then it would have the name of the king. And so all of them, all of the vessels would then be deciphered. Important information, because you would get information on the kings, but not too ritualistic or esoteric of a chant. Also in the burials and in gifting, these are figurines from the exhibit, uh, very fine figurines that the, was another form of Maya art. These are figurines from Conquen, the site that, uh, that we've been excavating for some time. I had to show these because we have the best figurines, or at least they have the funniest hats. You got it. And these hats come off. Um, this one, this is a shaman, a, a, a spiritual leader, and he actually, this hat that comes off, you can't see it here, but it has, it's like Harry Potter. It has a band of stars and half moons running around it. And this one, he's wearing a giant macaw uh, hat and a ball player. This is obviously the Kaiser, and this hourglass <laughs> hat with a warrior. But there's just so much art when you excavate the centers of these sites. It's just, you know, it's, it's disproportionate to the size of the population when you compare it to other civilizations in Mexico and Central America, this, this intense period of production of art. Now, what ties into both our work and the question of how art which was reflecting the apogee. It was part of what reinforced the success of the ruler and Maya civilization, but it was also contributed heavily to the collapse of Maya civilization. We don't think of art as being that important, but it can actually help collapse. I don't think the Frist is gonna be doing that, but um, these rulers for their costumes and elements of, of power and authority, they needed certain things, and it wasn't like simply rich having luxury goods, you know, the, the, the wealthy have diamonds and gold or something. This is more like the Pope's outfit. It's just, these are elements of, that you had to have to be a holy lord. You had to have the jade, uh, the jade ear spools and jade necklaces. You had to have um, these discs that uh, were covered with mosaics covered with mosaics of pyrite, what we call fool's gold, that would be glued to the discs and would make a mirror. And this wasn't for vanity. They used these mirrors to start fires. You know, when they had the blood-soaked paper, they would get, reflect in through the doorway and get the fires going with these mirrors. Conch shells, which had to come from, all these things had to come from very distant areas carved conch shells which would come from the, the Pacific or Caribbean coast. The feathers of the Quetzal bird which came from the distant highlands, not from the jungles, but from uh, coming down through trade from the highlands. And then uh, this is a stingray spine which was for the rulers the most important important and most common instrument for genital bloodletting. In fact, in most of the burials of the kings, they lay the stingray spine on the, on the pelvis of the skeleton to show that he had been a holy lord. And then these eccentrics, which were made of imported fine flint or a volcanic glass obsidian from the highlands. And these were used as scepters and also as uh, bloodletters. This is in the exhibit upstairs. This is one of these uh, that was used, and they would be used as scepters, but also the most important thing the king did was to, the, the auto-sacrifice, the self-laceration in their high mass. So the scepter would be a blood letter at the same time. And jade. These are jades that are in the exhibit. There's, there's more than this. Um, jade is green. That's the color of the forest. It's also the color of water, because the Maya make no distinction even today between blue and green. It's one color. And it's the color of the center and of the Saba tree. It is very, very holy. And the Maya just had tons of this jade. Some of the, some of the burials, they'll, they'll have multiple necklaces that will be 50, 60 pounds of jade beads. It was a very important part of the, of the costume. Now that brings us to both the question 
of the collapse of civilization and also to the Vanderbilt projects, which have been uh, probably the most active uh, of any university in studying the mystery of the collapse of this civilization because of course this whole area today is covered the cities are all buried in jungle and the mystery is why between 800 and 900 AD did this very successful civilization that had maintained this success for 2,000 years why did it collapse and there's a variety of factors involved but one of them had to do with the art and the ritual and the theater state and these are the trade routes of the ancient Maya world, which went along the Caribbean, along the Gulf, but especially important was this trade route from the highlands. This is the mountains, the volcanic highlands, where the volcanic glass, the jade, the quetzal feathers, the pyrite, all had to come from there and then travel first by river and all this way by river and then by land to the Maya centers. Vanderbilt's work, the Vanderbilt um, archaeological work, um, has been focused in this area for about the last 15 years at, at many different sites. It's a very large area, which as you can see is right at the connection between the highlands and the lowlands and right at the nexus of the major trade routes of the Maya world. And that's where we've been directing uh, these excavations, projects of varying size each year. Um, the Patesh Batun project that I ran uh, in, the, in the 90s was one of the largest ever. It had um, six camps and 300 workmen and about 40 archaeologists and uh, was too big. And at the very end, like a Kahula how I went mad. And, had a cerebral hemorrhage and everything it was a bit much. But since then, we've continued with large projects and you have all of these different specialists. Most of ours are Guatemalan students, many of whom got their master's or doctorate degrees at Vanderbilt uh, and who have now returned to their countries to direct archaeology. And we also work with French scholars as well and a few gringos, not too many. Um, this is showing the, uh, the camp of the Patesh Batun project. Uh, this is a National Geographic helicopter photo. And you can see the endless sea of rainforest around it. Most of this rainforest, this photo was taken in 93, I think. Most of this rainforest has now been destroyed, especially by ethanol production, uh, which is devastating. We think of ethanol as being ecologically great, but it, they actually chopped down rainforests to get a lot of it and to grow oil palm. Most of this is gone. There we excavated uh, uh, about six different cities, and the capital of those cities was one called Dos Pilas, and it was a completely military center. Very successful because it conquered most of the trade route uh, of the Pasión River. The main, the jungle is very difficult to move through. Um, in fact, that's another ridiculous thing in Apocalypto, where they have those guys running through the jungle. You know, if you run barefoot through the jungle, you will have, within a few meters, your feet will be absolutely filled with spines and everything else on earth. It is very difficult to move through the jungle. So the rivers, the few rivers they had, became kind of the super highways of the Maya world. And Dos Pilas conquered one of the largest, one of these, the Pasión River. And you see Dos Pilas here. We excavated a lot of sites in this area, and you see the river going down. And this is where Conquen is, right, this shows you where they are in Guatemala, right at the very base of the highlands where the mountains go up, and you get that very different environment. The, uh, the kingdom of Dos Pilas conquered the river. It was a very militaristic kingdom, constantly at war. And each time they had a victory, they constructed a hieroglyphic staircase, some of them quite huge. This shows a, a temple and shows the positions of the hieroglyphic staircases, each of them recording a victory, a military victory. And it became a very rich um, city from tribute and conquests. And uh, we had tombs uh, that we excavated that had treasures in them. Um, this is a very, very beautiful pot that's always on exhibit somewhere. Um, 
and caves. They also had caves that were full of treasures that were running underneath the site. This whole area um, has, a lot of, has a lot of caves, and the caves were very important places for ritual. Toward the end of the time of Dos Pilas' greatness, they, they formed a marriage alliance with a, another site all the way at the beginning of the trade route where the headwaters the, of, the, of the Pasion River, the head of navigation. And this panel, which is probably kind of hard to interpret, celebrates that because you see the king of Dos Pilas here, the glyphs identify them, this is a priest, and mostly eroded is a, a 13 or 14 year old prince who's doing his first genital bloodletting. And you can see the blood dripping into the bowl here. And standing behind the king is the queen who was identified as the Lady of Conquen. She was a princess from Conquen. And this marriage alliance gave them then control of the entire trade route. And this is the route, this river. The highlands begin here. Conquen is here, these Dos Pilas and these sites are in here, and this is the river route that leads all the way through the Maya world to the Gulf of Mexico. Now, in the last 10 years, we've been excavating at the beginning of this at the city of Conquen, which I just came from, and um, it's a river city, it's a swamp. It has more, I'm from New Orleans originally, and it actually has more mosquitoes than New Orleans. Uh, and, and is hotter, um, but uh, it's a largely inundated area, and this is where the Pasión River first becomes navigable. No more, the, after the waterfalls and cascades, it slows down, and from here on, you can use canoes to travel with your products to the rest of the Maya world. And the site, the most important thing about the site are its ports. There are six ports, each of them has a small palace of a noble, next to the port. Some of them are fortified. And that, this was for these, the, the Maya we know from descriptions in the conquest period had these very, very large trading canoes in which they would move along the river their products. Now at Conquen, uh, there is, uh, it's about the largest or tied for the largest palace in the Maya world. It's an enormous palace because naturally in this position they were in, they had uh, a, a great deal of wealth. And it, today, you know, the sites that, if you go to see a lot of them today, if they've been studied by archeologists, that doesn't mean they're going to be reconstructed. You excavate and then you rebury very often. And this palace was not known about for all this time because it's so large and covered with vegetation that it simply um, looks like a big hill. And so it wasn't noticed. Also, this was not noticed by the archaeologists or the looters because the site does not have any temples, which is what attracts uh, the, the sort of sensationalist, unfortunately, archaeology of the Maya world, and also attracts the looters looking for tombs. They, they don't have temples. I'll explain why in a second. And this was quite a sensation. This picture was from the New York, this is my favorite of the National Geographic press release photos. This was on the cover of the New York Times. And what I like about it is that this guy, this tall, handsome guy here, was identified as Arthur Demarest, uh, which <laughs> I was very pleased with. This is obviously some dumpy assistant of some kind, some lackey. This is showing you some, just some of the parts of the palace. The palace goes on for quite some distance, it has about 200 rooms. And uh, this is a reconstruction of what it was like. You can see that this was not just, it wasn't primarily a place for the king to live in. It was an administrative ritual palace to receive visitors and to impress them. Smaller chiefs from the nearby highland kingdoms that they would get the, the, the raw materials from, and then other visiting lords from Maya centers. And these, this is a person here. These disproportionately large rooms were covered with giant stucco sculptures. Uh, some of these are, are uh, 10 feet high. And this is just the head of one of these figures. And then the headdress 
would come out like that and the, and the body, and then with monsters in between. There's one stucco mask upstairs that, um, it's smaller, but it's from uh, an architectural facade like this where they would cover and they'd be painted in all different colors. We have uh, these, all of these stucco sculptures, we have an entire house that is filled with these stucco sculptures. We have no place to put them and the government of Guatemala won't take them they won't, they, you, you can't sell them or anything, but they won't take them back because they don't have any room in the storage facilities of the National Museum. So for about, you know, eight years now, I've been paying rent on this house full of stuccos. And this is showing one of the, the ruler at the, at the time of, of, the, of the greatest, the apogee of Conquen, which comes just before the collapse. We usually think of collapses of civilizations, we think of Rome, you know, and this sort of slow decline. But many collapses, uh, and this is something we can worry about, uh, happen at the very apogee. They're like bubbles, like the bubble, the, the economic one we had, where you build to a frenzied crescendo and then suddenly everything falls apart. And that is what happened in the Maya world. This was the period of, of crescendo. This, Monument dates to 796. It's about this big. Uh, and it shows the king, and he's a water lord. He's sitting on a water monster. And then two subordinates. This is a, a Sahal, like a lieutenant king. And this is a woman who is a city manager. And it's describing this, the holy lord. And these are all, these colored things here are all water symbols, because he was king of the river and controller of the water. 796, by 800, Conquen was completely abandoned and destroyed. And so you had this peak and then the destruction. These are some other monuments. Some of these were captured back from looters, and uh, we haven't restored it yet. Um, the, the Maya, we've trained them as restorers, and they themselves are slowly restoring it. And these are three of the ball court markers that show two kings playing the ball game. They also record that one of the kings made various conquests in the name of Taj Chana, the greatest king of Conquen. His name means great fiery turtle, which to us sounds kind of ridiculous. <laughs> but the turtle is, a, is, a, is an, uh, a carnivore in the river. They have these big turtles and they're snapping turtles and they eat the fish and they'll take your finger off. So they thought of, of turtles as a very aggressive, like we, we would have lions on our, on our crest of our royalty. They have a turtle. So he's a great fiery turtle. The reason why there are no um, temples at Conquen is this is showing a temple from Tikal. This is showing a wheats, a natural limestone tower. We're right at the base of the highlands. And so you have these mountains, and they're hollow. And th we, there's 33. So far, the cave archaeology team is a separate team of crazy spelunkers and archaeologists who go, it's insane. Archaeologists are insane in general, but cave archaeologists are totally insane because it's very, very dangerous. Uh, we have 33 kilometers of, I don't know what that is, in like 20 miles, of these systems. Um, now measured, and inside of them are hundreds and thousands of beautifully preserved artifacts that were offerings. And in front of some of them, we're digging right now, this particular place we're digging, um, some of them in the area have platforms with monuments in front of the hill. So these were the natural temples of the Maya. And as you can see, they're much more impressive than the artificial versions that they had in the areas without hills further north. Also at Conquen is the largest jade workshop in the New World. We've got uh, now oh, about 3,600 jade artifacts, some of which, like this, are boulders of 35 or 40 pounds because the, they had this large jade workshop. And a lot of the jades that you find at other sites and tombs, probably some in the exhibit here, that are found at other sites were being manufactured at Conquen, where the jade comes down from the highlands through the valleys, comes to Conquen at the beginning of the river, and there they would work it, and then by canoe it would go to the rest of the Maya world. And you can see the jade debris, and then final carved pieces. Now, 
as I said, these, you had these alliances, but then they broke up into smaller. It was a very unstable, volatile period. Again, kind of like the Renaissance in Northern Italy. And these competing states with status rivalry between them, sometimes warfare, more often competitive rituals, competitive art, competitive monuments, competitive ritual displays to draw more followers. This built up faster and faster into the eighth century when it really got out of control. And especially here on the, here at Dos Pilas and Conquen and the areas we've been excavating, this is the trade route that all of these goodies come down. And so great pressure was put on this route as an important place to control and warfare became endemic. And starting, or starting very early, it's much earlier than the rest of the Maya collapse, uh, starting around 760, this is Dos Pilas in 760. This is Dos Pilas in 761. The city was besieged. They tore down parts of their own temples and palaces to construct stone defensive walls with palisades on top of them, double walls, uh, trying to hold off the enemies. And we find, we find places where the defenses were breached and you have hundreds of these spearheads um, that are found in those areas. And you can see they fortified not only at Dos Pilas, but it spread through the whole region. They fortified their temples and made them into fortresses. All of this coming very suddenly and very destructively. You know, part of the rainforest adaptation of the Maya that I explained earlier was this dispersion. You had large cities, but they were spread out, very green cities. Once you have warfare going, you can't do that. You have to concentrate population uh, for defensive reasons. And so this was made, this, this area had the earliest uh, collapse in Maya civilization, probably because it was on this route of intensive competition for goodies. This is Conquen. It shows one of the entrances to the palace that has in front of it this sacred cistern, which you see here drained, and we've restored it, um, that held spring water and was probably used for ablutions, for purifying yourself before you entered the palace to see the king or the religious officials. You could step down here and and purify yourself and come out and then continue into the palace. At 800 AD, when we excavated this, it was an overwhelming job. We had to ended up having to bring in a huge team of osteologists, of bone specialists, because this thing was completely filled with human bones. And um, we still, we have a Vanderbilt graduate student right now who's studying these as well. It's been, it's been like six years. We'll probably be studying this collection for another 20. Um, in this pond, we found this particular pool. There were 31 um, assassinated nobles, men, women, children, uh, two pregnant women and two fetuses, all age groups, all very high status, which we can tell from the analysis of their bones, from their diet, from the cranial deformation. And they were killed with great ritual. They were not, they were in, in beautiful costumes and had incredible things in the pool with them. So it's sort of counterintuitive from our point of view that you would assassinate these people, but they would be dressed in great finery and with uh, very valuable things going into the pond. One of these, one of these had 18 jaguar canines, uh, no, 36 jaguar canines which means they had to kill 18 jaguars to get those canines. It's probably, that's much more precious than jade. Um, and again, all of this, as they were assassinated, they were put into the pond. The team that analyzed this is the Forensic Foundation of Guatemala, who normally work with the UN uh, and the Hague and the World Court studying massacres around the world. And the head of that team happens to be someone who got his degree under me, and I convinced him to take a break from these modern massacres and analyze this. So we had forensic analysis of all of these bones, and we know that this was the most of them were killed by a spear thrust to the spinal column, 
uh, in some cases uh, in the lower back through the spinal column, which again seems gruesome, but that is that or decapitation are actually the two most humane ways to kill somebody. I mean, they didn't have the gas chamber or whatever, because you immediately sever the spinal column. We since have found another, another of these cisterns, which has another 25 uh, bodies of elites in it that we're still studying. Now what happened then, this route, all of these wars broke out, first at Dos Pilas, then spreading to everywhere, small villages, and finally destroying Conquen. The trade route was cut off, and the uh, battles and warfare and sieges all along this area between 760 and 800. Now the Maya civilization at this point had a lot of other problems in other areas. The whole superstructure of the society put too much pressure on the economic base and they became vulnerable to droughts, periodic droughts. They would be unable to respond properly. They were destroying their soils to a large extent. Their civilization was, was suffering from too much success. Uh, but when these trade routes were cut off, that, that intensified the warfare everywhere because now there was less of these precious substances coming in and therefore that much more competition and conflict over them. And so the Maya collapse begins chronologically. The earliest we have is in, is in the area of the Pasión River trade route where we're excavating and that starts around 760, 750 AD. Um, and then it spreads to other areas starting around 800. This piece is in the exhibit. I was very surprised to see this. Um, this is a, a special kind of pottery called Pabayon Fine Orange. And uh, for some reason, just before these cities disintegrated, this ceramic shows up in a lot of context. This pottery shows up. And so it's kind of a marker. Whenever you find it, you know that that's about the time the city collapsed, whatever city it was. And so the collapse of Maya civilization was kind of a domino. Uh, in chronology, it wasn't as sudden as people once thought. It started around 750, and it didn't end until around 900 or a little later. It started down here and then spread along the river route. And then you can see these numbers I have. This is from uh, a book that I've written on this. And um, you can see these numbers, and that's kind of the order of zones collapsing one after another. And then the jungle took back over, and these cities now, uh, all of them, at least in southern Guatemala, are, are literally buried in jungle. And that makes them very challenging to excavate. So that's the story of the collapse of Maya civilization, but I wanted to just have one ending positive note, since this is such a grim story. And it also could be seen as kind of racist to say that this is the collapse of Maya civilization, because there are 11 million Maya uh, here today. Ted Fisher is one of the people uh, from Vanderbilt who studies the living Maya the modern Maya, who are descendants of this civilization. The classic Maya civilization, their holy cities, collapsed. And the southern lowlands of the Paten jungle was abandoned. But Maya society survived elsewhere, in the highlands, in northern Yucatan. And those people are gradually moving back into the jungle and continue today and have a very, this is all, these are all pictures, actually the pictures my son took, of some of the rituals that we participate in with the modern Kekchi Maya who live around the site. And Vanderbilt has very active development projects with them. And a little known fact is that Vanderbilt, actually this is that peninsula I showed you of Conquen, Vanderbilt bought six kilometers of Pasión River rainforest. And uh, I know around here people say, they, they find, see some building and say, Vanderbilt probably owns that. You know, Vanderbilt owns everything. Well, they own six kilometers of the Pasión River rainforest, which they bought because the ethanol people were going to destroy it. They were also going to drive out the Maya population there that lived in the jungle, and they would have, uh, they would have destroyed the site as well. So Vanderbilt purchased this, and it's now a park. You see 
an aerial view here on the Pasión River that's used, it's a beautiful jungle park that's used for reforestation, for forest preservation, for scientific studies, and for a lot of humanitarian projects with the modern Maya. We're very involved in projects with water systems. And the most recent one, uh, with the help of, of the Finns, uh, is in women's, girls' education, so that these people can actually, the women can actually go to school, which they're not able to do today. So there is a, a positive lining to this grim story. And the, uh, the Maya civilization, in a very different form, without the holy lords and without the, the warfare, except we do have narcos battling each other now and again, but among the Maya, uh, continues to thrive as a, as a very important and vigorous culture today. Thank you.